pretty soon you're going to understand that pun. But here is my email and phone number. I encourage you to write it down and understand that I'm here for you. Uh, one of my positions in the Union for Reform Judaism as a lay clergy relations specialist is specifically to work with congregations and rabbis in transition. And indeed, all of you are there, and I welcome you to call me directly. One moment, please. So Adam, thank you again, and thanks everyone for coming to this webinar on Building Partnerships at Work, Rabbinic Transitions, Mazel Tov, it's a rabbi. If you're on this webinar, you're either a rabbi in transitioning, transitioning from one congregation to another, or you are a lay leader of a congregation in rabbinic transition, saying goodbye to your current rabbi and getting ready to welcome your new rabbi, probably this coming summer. And it's been a crazy ride, hasn't it? The search process is done appropriately, and it was done appropriately in a confidential manner. So only a few really know the rabbi and what skills and passions she or he will bring to your congregation. Or do you really? After all, you really only had one or two interviews with him, and perhaps went to visit her at her current congregation. Yes, you did your due diligence, and you may have been successful in conveying your excitement about the new rabbi to the congregation. But somewhere in the back of your mind, you and some others might be wondering, did we make the right choice? Will our new rabbi be all we want and need her or him to be? And for the rabbi, we shake the magic eight ball and we find out that the rabbi, the rabbis on this call may be saying, did I make the right choice? Was this the right decision for my family? And what about my kids? They are leaving their friends behind and my spouse left a good job for my move. What have I done? Is this the right move for me? And perhaps more important, is this the right move for my family? Well, I'm sorry to tell everybody on this call that there is no magic eight ball to tell you the future. The fact is that both congregational leadership and rabbi have done all you can do to make sure that you both made the right decision. You've researched, you've talked to one another and to others, you both did your due diligence and you came to a mutual decision to take the leap, to make this move and begin what all hope will be a long and lasting relationship. What that means is that the rabbi and the congregation have agreed to change. And change brings with it uneasiness, double-guessing decisions and doubt, while at the same time, change brings excitement, new opportunities, and almost unlimited potential. Welcome to the Oive Zone. So let me translate that for you. Welcome to the Neutral Zone, or to the Mead Bar, to the Wilderness, that in-between time sandwiched between the ending and the new beginning. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and we'll get to that in a few slides. For now, before we go on, let's pause, and let's acknowledge the moment, because this is really big. In addition to the feelings of oive that most transitions bring, this is a really important moment in the life of your congregation and in the life of your rabbinate. So let's acknowledge that moment in the way we know how. Please feel free to read with me, or you can say it silently as I read it together. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, shehechianu v'ki'imanu v'higianu lazman hazeh. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruling spirit to the universe, who brought us to life, sustained us, and brought us to this very special moment in our lives. Yes, shehechianu moment. I remember coming to my first solo congregation. And I met someone in the congregation who said to me, isn't it weird to know that you're going to be in all of our family albums? Wow. Every baby naming, every bar mitzvah, every confirmation, every wedding, even funeral gatherings, you rabbis are going to be, if not in photo albums, indelible in people's memories. Indeed, it's a Shehechiano moment. And it's also an historic moment. For some congregations, the rabbinic position opens up literally once in a lifetime. For others, a new rabbi brings stability and promise for the future. 
Indeed, a new rabbi can also have significant impact on the greater community, even outside of the congregation. But most of all, saying farewell to your current rabbi or your current congregation and welcoming a new rabbi or congregation into your life is nothing short of a life cycle moment in the life of the congregation. And when thought this way as a life cycle event, you can begin to see that in addition to an organizational change, what is also happening is akin to a family in transition. So let's talk about change versus transition. Change is situational. It's the new site, the new boss, the new team roles, the new policy. Transition, on the other hand, is the psychological process people go through to come to terms with the new change. Change is external, while transition is internal. So let's get back to that neutral zone joke I mentioned earlier, that in-between time, that sandwich between the endings and the new beginnings. Change happens in an instant. Transition is a process and is about a state of mind. Change happens in an instant. Transition takes a long time. It's a process. Change happens. Transition is a journey. For every beginning starts with an ending. So let's begin with the ending. For the rabbi, you have to say goodbye to your current congregation or to your completing rabbinical school. For the congregation, you too have to close the chapter and say goodbye. If there was no closure, you may want to discuss how you can bring closure to your community now. Hopefully much of this is already happening. If not, it's a good idea to pause and reflect on how the change and transition is affecting your community. If you have done this already, now is a good time to take stock. Have you read your congregation correctly? Has any group or constituency been overlooked? Has another emerged? You can, ident you can do this best by identifying who has lost what. What does this mean to the office staff? What did this mean to the parent of the bar mitzvah in September? Or what about the mother whose son tragically died last month? What does it mean to the president or even the original search chair for the former rabbi? A change in rabbi takes but an instant, really. In most congregations, the magical day is July 1st. But rabbinic transition is a process. It takes years for a rabbi to earn trust, respect, and please God, love. It is built on communication, through conversations, through relationship building. Every congregant can mark a different moment where she or he could say, so-and-so is now my rabbi. In fact, so too with a rabbi when she or he enters a congregational family and say, wow, it may have taken four years, but now I realize that this is my congregation too. My family and I belong here. Most congregants don't know how to name this process. This process is made even harder with congregations that had a beloved rabbi retire or pass away suddenly. Again, this is why it's important to acknowledge the loss and be a part of the healing process. Acknowledge the circumstances of change. Is there sadness or loss with the changing of rabbi? Embrace this. Is there relief? Acknowledge the loss openly and sympathetically. Allow for everyone to go on their own journeys. There is no right or wrong. If a rabbi is leaving, chances are some members of the congregation are in mourning, while others are anticipating an exciting new rabbi. While some are gaining a new and dynamic rabbi, others are losing their precious rabbi. Everybody, they are your members too. This is a slide I'd like you to memorize. Uh, you guys will all be on a journey with me over the next two years. We'll be meeting at, at uh, a conference I'll be telling you about later. And this is the Bible that we'll be working with. Often congregations start at the beginning and then deal with the ending. People think that transition begins with the beginning, then there's a middle, then there's an ending. But beginning with the ending, navigating the neutral zone, and ending with the beginning is the root of a healthy transition. Again, begin with the ending, go through the meat bar, the wilderness, and end with the beginning. 
The neutral zone is a stage filled with discomfort, ambiguity, and unease. According to William Bridges, the best way to effect, effectively manage each of these stages is to understand its effect emotionally and psychologically on all of the participants. It's a process. People like to be heard and feel more comfortable when they're brought into the discussion. That's why it's so important to have clear expectations and communication with the new rabbi, the president, from the search committee to the rabbi, from the leadership to the congregation. There should be a good system in place for good and clear communication in all directions. It's important to remember that a new rabbi is walking into a middle of a conversation that's been going on for 50, 75, 100 years. First say goodbye, then go through the wilderness, and only then can you feel at home in the beginning. So where are you on this transitional map? Identifying where people are is crucial to managing a successful transition. But before you can do that, you have to identify where you are. So we're going to try something here right now. Adam is going to bring up a poll, and we're going to ask you, where would you put yourself on this chart? Would you put yourself in the endings, the neutral zone, or are you there already? Are you in the new beginnings? And Adam, if you can just tell us how to do that, please. Um, the, you should all see the poll on your screens now. Just feel free to click on any of those answers, and, and we'll see the uh, results stream in live. I definitely encourage everyone to participate so we can get a, a nice reading of, of who's on the call. Okay, thank you. This could not be better. Um, Adam, can you put that up on the screen so people can see it? Yeah, let's let's give it another minute or a couple more seconds. People are still voting. All right. So look what we have. Thirty-five percent of you say that you're in endings. 43% that you are wandering in the meat bar, you're wandering about in that neutral zone. And 22% of you are saying, I'm there, I'm, not, I'm there already. So, oops, I didn't mean to do that. So, what this means is that some of you are here, some of you are here, you're here, we have some people here. Most of you said that you're right here in the neutral zone. We have a lot of people in endings. And I dare say, if I could, I think some people are there where they haven't even admitted that there's an ending yet or they refuse to admit that there's an ending. My guess is also that where's the search committee? Right here. The search committee is in the new beginnings. They've come to grips with the loss of their rabbi. They've struggled with a new rabbi looking different, acting different, sounding different, and they made a decision, so they're in the new beginnings. The people who love the old rabbi, the person who has three children and the former rabbi bar mitzvah two of them, and the next, the, your third child is being bar mitzvah in September, they're probably squarely here in the ending, or not even in the endings. We have to be able to map where everybody is in our congregation, for it will make dealing with the transition a whole lot easier. You find yourself balancing the success felt by the search committee with their trep trepidation felt by those who never wanted the, the last rabbi to leave. So if you look at the former slide, you may be saying, well, now I know where everyone is. It's akin to trying to balance all of these plates at the same time. And I'm sorry to tell you, it is. The excitement of beginning a new position with the sadness of the loss of your family might feel having to leave their home and friends. You're balancing those. Yes, as a manager of a transition, you have to balance people all in the endings, the neutral zone, and in the beginnings. And at the same time, you have to balance where you are as well. This is a fantastic slide. It's a wonderful graph of understanding the neutral zone and how to navigate it. Once the rabbi and the congregation announce the end, which we now know is the first stage of transition, many differing emotions will surface within your congregation. You may see signs of shock and anger, fear, grief, frustration, confusion, certainly stress. And, what, and according to this, once you see those signs, you know where to plot them on, on the chart. Once you engage a new rabbi, 
many congregations mistakenly believe that they are in the beginning. Just as Moses had to lead the people of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years before their beginning, so too do you as congregational leaders, lay and rabbinic, have to lead your congregation through the Midbar or the neutral zone. While you're in the neutral zone, there's a lot of ambiguity. If you do nothing with that wandering, it may lead to overload, impatience, and anxiety. Left alone, the natural current will allow your congregational system to drift to the negative. It's much easier that way. However, with true transition awareness and management, you can steer your congregation to the right side of this chart, to the positive. Look at the emotional energy found in new beginnings with new possibilities. Here you may find signs of creativity, of risk-taking, of optimism, of motivation, of planning, of purpose and vision. So once again, your congregation in the neutral zone is right here. It's in a very ambiguous place. And there's a current, and the current moves in this direction. Which means that left unintended, people will wallow in this entire area. Transitional management is about creating exercises and moments and times where you're going to push your congregation into this area, which is all very positive and very healthy. To look at this concept in another light, in addition to looking at transition as endings, neutral zone, and new beginnings, this chart offers another path, namely reconciliation, reorientation, and recommitment. That is, endings happen for a reason sometimes good and sometimes bad. Reconciliation really means to meet again. And that's precisely what must happen in your congregation during this phase, which you should be in now. In many congregations, not everyone in your membership is on board with the decision or even the reason. This is the time to meet again. This is the time to meet again as one congregation. And the best way to do that is by saying goodbye. Embrace that transitions are times of both sadness and celebration. While some are gaining a new and dynamic rabbi, understand that others are losing their rabbi. Acknowledge the circumstance of change. Acknowledge the, the feelings of sadness or loss, and also acknowledge that others might feel relieved. Admitting that some people may be sad does not mean that you were wrong in your decision. It's just embracing a member of your family who truly feels that way. One way that you can say goodbye is by having small group appreciations and farewells. The board and past presidents could have time with the parting rabbi. The faculty and staff, and perhaps past faculty and staff. Congrega congregation at large can be meeting with the rabbi for celebratory events, and even the greater community. And one of the things we've learned in transition is giving people a piece of the past. Mark the rabbi's departure and accomplishments through a tribute Shabbat dinner, a, a tribute Shabbat service, and even with pictures. Very often hanging a former rabbi's picture in the congregation with other rabbis is a way of holding on to the past to just say, this person served as our rabbi. Under difficult and complex endings, we have to understand, again, while some people are gaining a new and dynamic rabbi, others are losing their rabbi, and we have to remember that they are members too. Communicate, communicate, communicate. When you have nothing more to say, tell them what you wish you could tell them. This is an old slide, but it says a thousand words. You can only have one rabbi at a time, and that rabbi is the one you have now. As for rabbis, you can only have one congregation at a time, and that's the congregation that you're in now. Some congregations are going to be honoring their former rabbi by naming them Rabbi Emeritus. We're going to do this quickly, so if you are a congregation that is naming your rabbi Rabbi Emeritus, please get in touch with me and we can have a conversation more in depth offline. But in short, the ro role of the Rabbi Emeritus needs to be clearly defined and accepted. What does the Rabbi Emeritus do with life cycle events, attending services, especially during the high holidays? Typically, the CCAR and the URJ, let me change that, always the CCAR and the URJ strongly encourage rabbis emeriti to stay away from their congregation for at least six months, ideally a year. 
This allows the new rabbi to dig in her or his relationship roots. A rabbi emeritus can be a great mentor to the new rabbi. And for new rabbis emeriti who may be having to find to, uh, who may be having to navigate their lives as newly retired rabbis, the Central Conference of American Rabbis has an organization called the North American Organization for Reform Retired Rabbis, where it can help the, new, the retired rabbis learn to live in this new chapter of life. So we're not going to say no but, but we're going to say yes and. We want to move from strength to strength, and remember how you say goodbye speaks volumes to how you say hello. This is one of the true beautiful gems that I picked up in a congregation. It was a rabbi that was, lived, that was the rabbi there for 20 some odd years and was retiring, was being named a rabbi emeritus. And in the hallway, some people came by to talk to the president about the new rabbi. And the president was so excited about the new rabbi. She's wonderful. She's young. She plays guitar. It's really going to be fantastic. And the rabbi that was retiring came up and she turned around and she said, oh, rabbi, I'm sorry. We love you too. And she said, I feel like I'm spending the day with my fiance and coming home to my husband. And that is classic neutral zone language. We have to mind the gap. We have to be very careful during this in-between time. We have to balance honoring our rabbi with sharing our excitement and expectations of our new rabbi. To everything there is a season, a time to say farewell, and a time to say hello. We do also need to mind the gap. And the most vulnerable population in your gap are the bar and bat mitzvah class for next year. Understand that parents are very vulnerable here. Typically, the kids don't care less. But it's the parents of bar and bat mitzvah classes that are very, very anxious right now. Tell them that you know that they're anxious. Tell them that they will be among the first to learn of the new appointment. Tell them they will be the first to meet the new rabbi. And while we believe very strongly in separations, that right now your new rabbi has a congregation to lead, and it's not yours, that summer letters to bar and bat mitzvah kids, especially for the kids being b'nai mitzvah in the fall, is a very good idea. And perhaps when the very first barbecue meet and greets in the summer should be with the bar and bat mitzvah families. This is a good time to transition from your search committee to a transition committee. It's a separate committee from the search committee. You want to select only a few members of the search committee and then populate that committee with people from other parts of the congregation, on board and not, and at least one person, if not more, from the same demographic as your new rabbi and rabbi's family. A transition committee should meet for at least 18 months from the first day as rabbi. So a transition committee should meet for two, probably two years. We need to notify the congregation, then the greater community of your new rabbi. You want to pay attention to your new family member. I have a horrible, horrible story about a rabbi who moved to a new community. I was a regional director back then, and I had made a, a habit of calling all new rabbis right in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I asked the rabbi how Rosh Hashanah went, and he said it was miserable. He said our home is not going to be ready until November, so we're renting an apartment. An Erev Rosh Hashanah meal was um, pizza sitting on our unpacked boxes. Rosh Hashanah, pizza, really? And the reason wasn't because the congregation was hard or cold. The opposite. They had assumed that the rabbi just needed his time alone before high holidays. Reach out to this new family in your community. Help with the rabbi's relocation. Help with the rabbi's house hunting. Introduce them to schools. Help the spouse or partner find work. Introduce them to the supermarkets, the doctors, etc. You can say hello to your new rabbi who's not living in your community yet by putting them on your congregational mailing list. Send them temple bulletin, bulletins and other e-newsletter. You can send once a week or once a month a vital reading file. These are letters that the rabbi and or leadership get that you want your new rabbi to read just to get the flavor of the community, not to give you input on right now, because they're still leading a congregation. You may want to subscribe your new rabbi to the Jewish and secular press and have it sent directly to their homes wherever they're living. But hardest of all, remember that you already have a rabbi. Your new rabbi already has a congregation. 
and they need to say goodbye as well. Once your new rabbi has arrived, you want your congregation to be able to meet your, your rabbi as much as possible. So, uh, engage parlor meetings, staff retreats, a board get-together. Introduce the rabbi, most importantly, to like demographics. If you want your rabbi to succeed and be happy, then the rabbi's family needs to succeed and be happy. Introduce them to people who will become their authentic friends. Ask the new rabbi, what does she or he need to succeed? What type of office support does a new rabbi need? Are there different technological or strengths that the new rabbi has? How can you make the office theirs? Every congregation, especially now, is dealing with budget. But it's so very important to mark a change and help the rabbi make that office space theirs. Some rabbis even ask for rabbinic coaching. This only helps the congregation by giving the rabbi more tips and more strength and more strategies to leave the lead the congregation ahead. And most important and interesting of all, you must have, in the fall of the year, a service of installation. Now what does that mean, an installation service? I mean, you can call Sears, and I hear they do installations for $29.95. But on, on all seriousness, rabbinic installations mark a holy and historic moment in the lifetime of the congregation. And it also marks a historic life cycle moment even for the rabbi. It's a time for the congregation to sometimes literally see the passing of the Torah from one generation to another. And please, God, we want this relationship to last. And so we urge every congregation and every rabbi to put in place an agreement to have a mutual and ongoing review in the synagogue. There's a wonderful saying that came from our old, old prayer books, The Big Gates of Blue, where it said that while a painter is creating this piece of art in the course of painting, sometimes the artist has to set the brush down and to step back and to look at the picture, to see what needs to be done, what, sh what, what direction should be taken. That's the best definition I've ever heard of review. Review is about sharpening the saw. Review is not about proving. Review is about improving. We will be having a webinar in the early fall to help new rabbis and congregations together work on our review process. We don't believe in cookie cutters. But we do have some ideas. Again, if you get in touch with me, I'm happy to share them with you before those webinars. As I said earlier, we are now in a cohort of congregations that are going through rabbinic transition. And there are several things that we will be offering you. First of all, uh, and we'll get this date to you as soon as we have it, but in February of next year, we will be having uh, our third annual Shalit Symposium. This is a symposium funded by the Shalit Foundation that pays for you um, to come to meet as a cohort. And we'll be spending three days together, new rabbis and their presidents, president-elects, or searcher transition chairs, so one rabbi and one lay leader, to come together where we will be working on transitional management and how we can help the transition become seamless and build a partnership that will last. As I said, we'll let you know the date as soon as we have it. It will probably run a, a Saturday night or Sunday through Monday or Tuesday, so uh, rabbis will be able to stay in their congregation for Shabbat. Again, in uh, the fall of 2012, we'll be having another webinar on how to get to know your congregation, how to get to know your new rabbi, which will concentrate also on uh, mutual and ongoing review. You can also call your union district rabbi. Um, and uh, as I said, you can also call me, and we're happy to give you one-to-one -one support. Our text says, find yourself a rabbi and acquire yourself a friend. Please, God, that should be true. A new rabbi coming into the community, if things work well, will stay a lifetime. And relationship will be, relationships will be built. We hope that we can help you build strong and lasting relationships with your rabbi and with your congregation. We're all here for you. The uh, information on the page in front of you are rabbis that serve your congregations throughout North America. And of course, I'm always available to talk to you specifically about change and transition. So I'm going to end right now by asking if there are any questions. I'm going to once again ask that Adam uh, take the controls and find out if anyone's going to write in questions or like to raise their hand and ask. 
Uh, it is now 1.34, and we can continue until about 10 minutes of the hour of 2. So, Adam, I'm going to hand it over to you right now. Great. Uh, we, did, we did have a couple questions asking if this will be recorded and if the slides will be available. Uh, the answer to both is yes. They'll be available on the URJ webinar archive site, which is urj.org slash webinars with an S slash archive. And you'll find it in the leadership section. Uh, we do have some questions that came in. Um, there was one question... Um, and also, feel free to raise your hand, um, and I can unmute you, and you can speak your question or comment to Rabbi um, Wolfman, and uh, we can do it that way as well. Um, but we did have a, a question that came in. I'm not sure exactly which process you're referring to, um, Kathy Schindel. Uh, does this process, process has, have any differences with a part-time rabbi change? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for that question. By the way, before I get to Kathy's question, Skylar, I see that um, you mentioned that the sound hasn't been great. Uh, we tried to uh, fix it, and again, um, I, I belong to you guys, so please feel free to call, and we can, we can do this one-to-one. Uh, -one. Sure it does. Uh, Part-time rabbis, uh, there, there's a joke in the rabbinate. You're not going to want to hear it. Uh, there's no such thing as a part-time rabbi, only a part-time pay. I mean, really, what, um, I, I belong to a congregation of 900 families, and my rabbi works between 60 and 80 hours a week. So does that mean that part-time is only 40 hours a week? Part-time rabbi really means that there's a part-time salary because of budget or size constraints. And so you want to be very, very clear as to what the responsibilities are going to be. You can't bite off more than you can chew in a part-time congregation. So most certainly, you're going to want to do everything we've talked about today. Kathy, we're going to talk about uh, communication. We're going to be talking about introductions. We're going to be talking about saying the goodbyes. Um, not mentioned on your question, but I'll raise it. Is there another transition happening at the same time? Are you going from a full-time rabbi to a part-time rabbi? That's a transition in what people will expect. Are you going from a student rabbi to a part-time rabbi? That's another transition. Are you going from two rabbis to one or vice versa? So the biggest difference with part-time rabbi is to be able to spend time and clarify what part-time means. It certainly doesn't mean I'm only going to do two funerals a month, but it can mean that we're not going to be doing X, Y, and Z, or at least not with uh, the rabbi. Okay, we had another question. Um, should the transition committee be constituted now if we are planning for a new rabbi entering July 1st? Benedict, great, um, uh, great question. Um, yeah, you should because you're saying goodbye to your rabbi now. Um, and when I say now, I'm talking about April. This is a good time to start con to constituting. Again, as for the makeup, I would have a, just a few people from the search committee because they have the historical memory, they have the background. But I'd also get people from the rabbi's demographic. Um, you can call your union rabbi. We've got this amazing database. Tell us your new rabbi. We'll let you know, you know how many kids, how old they are, what grades are they in, um, and, and get some people in that cohort on your transition committee. You're also going to want people representing uh, the outreach, just like you did at the search committee. Uh, other interfaith families on the committee, uh, past presidents, uh, uh, gurus in town politics, uh, who knows who, so uh, they can learn about the school system. Uh, you're also going to want people who really know your current rabbi. And one of the co-committees could be saying goodbye. So you need the, your transition committee to start right now. Um, what type of goodbyes are we going to have? What type of tributes are, go are we going to have? Uh, are we going to have opportunities to say goodbye to the rabbi in, in small groups or large groups? So yes, I would uh, uh, start right now. Um, we do have a hand raise. I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge... Uh, Brian, you're unmuted. All right, Brian, you may need to type your question in the questions log because uh, you may not have a built-in microphone. So you can either switch to telephone mode, and I'll see that, and you can call in and uh, raise your hand again, and I'll unmute you, or feel free to note your question in the questions log. Um, While we're waiting for him, uh, Jerry has a question. Uh, he says, uh, your comments assume a new permanent rabbi. What observations do you have for a transition with an interim rabbi? Excellent question. First of all, way to go for getting an interim rabbi. Uh, not every congregation needs an interim rabbi, but interim rabbis are rabbis who are trained in working with congregations um, for only one year. 
uh, when we teach these interim rabbis, uh, we teach them that rule number one is the hardest and most important job you have is saying goodbye. The hardest and most important job is leaving. Therefore, those deep relationship roots that we spoke about earlier is not something that the, the interim rabbi is going to work on. The interim rabbi is going to however, uh, put priority, ideally, on making sure the congregation is running and helping the leadership and the congregation really focus on what type of direction they want to move in. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, transition, the other things do apply. Uh, you do want people to meet the interim rabbi. It's not as vital that everyone in the synagogue meet the new rabbi. It's not as vital that every constituency outside of the congregation, meaning United Way or Federation or, or the local ministry association, that's not vital. Uh, it is vital that the Bar and Bat Mitzvah class meet the new rabbi because that, new ra that interim rabbi is going to be dealing with them right away. It is vital that the interim rabbi be introduced to the staff uh, and to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the committee chairs and, and board officers for sure. So just understand that with an interim rabbi, you're dealing with someone who you know will only be there for one year. Adam? Yeah. Um, there's a question about uh, from Benedict. If we are retaining a current rabbi as our scholar in residence, should we prepare a written document of the duties and responsibilities? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I'd have to unpack that. I don't know exactly what that means. It can mean a lot of things. But let's make believe for a second it's akin to rabbi emeritus. The bottom line is this, friends. There can only be one rabbi at a time. And as a, uh, let's take July 1st as, as, as that magic day. On July 1st, when Rabbi Eric Yaffe, joke, joke, when Rabbi Eric Yaffe becomes your new rabbi, Rabbi Yaffe is now your rabbi. And whether you've had a mer rabbi emeritus for 20 years or your rabbi of 20 years is becoming scholar in residence, the buck stops with the new rabbi. So what does that mean? It means, um, well, gee, scholar in residence, you've been here for 15 years and I love you and my mother just died, I want you to do the funeral. The answer has to be, you need to speak with the new rabbi because all decisions are done through the new rabbi. So yes, you really do have to write something up and be very, very specific. And I would also include your new rabbi in that discussion. Great. Um, there's a couple questions regarding, I guess, the Cantor rabbinic relationship. Um, how long should you expect to wait until the new rabbi can evaluate or review the Cantor educator and preschool director? Okay, well for that one, please call me uh, because we don't know if there's anything that you need to unpack with that one. Are there issues already bubbling up uh, and you're just waiting for the new rabbi to make that decision? The answer is kind of tricky, right? Because in, in every synagogue there's this um, First of all, every synagogue is different, and as Reformed Jews, we, we embrace that. Uh, let's, let's make some presumptions here, that um, the cantor ha really has to, ha has two supervisors, uh, the rabbi and the head of the music committee or ritual committee, uh, that the religious school director has two supervisors, the rabbi and the head of the education committee or the school committee. It's complex. It's just not easy. It's not black and white. Uh, from day one, the rabbi is the supervisor. The rabbi is the, what I joke is the CRO, the chief religious officer. Uh, but the rabbi also has, cre has to create relationship and has to understand a new culture. Here's something I glossed over very quickly, and I probably should take more time on that. If your congregation can afford it, and it shouldn't cost a whole lot of money, I would urge you sometime in the summer or fall to have a staff retreat. No president, no board members. Uh, you may want to hire a facilitator if you're blessed to have the resources. If not, then have the rabbi facilitate it. The group that your staff needs to form as a group before they can move ahead and lead your congregation. Remember the quote I said earlier, the rabbi is walking in in the middle of a conversation. So let's take the summer to have a, a, a staff retreat so they can form together as a group. Um, if there are issues with your other staff, even other senior staff, I would have private conversation with your new rabbi because you don't want to keep any secrets uh, and you as rabbi and president want to be on that same page. But please feel free to call me separately and we can talk about this offline. And then uh, uh, another question, uh, if, if we are bringing in a new rabbi and a new cantor who will most likely be a part-time cantor, do we need to have a separate transition committee? Is there a protocol for how the incoming rabbi and cantor should work together? 
Okay, I thought your question was going to go in a different uh, area. So is there a protocol the way they should work together? Yeah, as my grandmother taught me, they should be mensches. Uh, they're going to have to form a partnership. And they're, they're going to have to learn how to work together. Um, as a full-time rabbi and a part-time cantor, they're going to work as a team. And there's no question who, that every team needs a captain, and that captain is going to be the rabbi. So they're going to have to work on that together. Um, uh, in terms of um, transition, absolutely. You want, remember, if, if a rabbi and a, and a cantor are going to succeed, friends, let's bring this to educator and youth advisor and fourth grade teacher, right? The relationship groups have to be, roots have to be dug deep. And that's what clergy does best, digging relationship roots. So you want the, this new cantor to have meet and greets. Um, is there a choir? Is there a junior choir? Um, the uh, barn bat mitzvah class, if they're responsible for that, these are absolutely people that you're going to want them to transition to. But if they're part-time, I would do. I would remember two things. One, that little mini conversation we had about what part-time means, and really being able to to transition them only into the identified areas. And B, understand that you've got to do this with the rabbi's transition in mind, and that must take precedent because they are that CRO, that first uh, senior person in the congregation. I also see another question, which I'll answer in 30 seconds, actually I'll in 10 seconds. Is the rabbi emeritus traditionally a paid position? Traditionally, no, not at all. Um, some congregations will negotiate something for Medigap or until a rabbi can get Medicare. Um, sometimes there'll be some negotiations about, well, what if there are life cycle events? Um, typically, uh, congregations don't charge for life cycle events. That's appropriate. Uh, but if a rabbi is on vacation, for example, perfect opportunity to have a rabbi emeritus do a life cycle event. Uh, does the congregation compensate that rabbi, um, rabbi emeritus? Um, that's something that you, you do have to negotiate. Adam? Yep. Um... If the transition committee is constituted now, before the new rabbi comes on board, what should the transition committee be doing with the new rabbi? Excellent. Uh, well, here, first of all, use that word flexible. Because you, um, if you don't know who the new rabbi is going to be yet, then you, can, you can't hardly um, name people that are part of his age constituent or, or uh, family constituency. So you may have to add some people to the committee. Uh, but if you uh, for a new rabbi, again, you want to introduce them to your community. With the local newspaper, with the Jewish press, make sure that they're on your temple email blast and get the newsletter. Just feed that information. Uh, but I'm not quite sure if I understand the question of how do you welcome the new rabbi if you don't know who that person is yet, and maybe I'm just um, not understanding. Um, in parentheses, it did say, uh, what I, I think the assumption is that they already know who the new rabbi is. It says, what, what should they be doing with the new rabbi as opposed to the old rabbi. Oh, excellent. Uh, just as I said before, the new rabbi, you want them to get acclimated. Um, it, it, one of my favorite stories is um, uh, there was a rabbi who was moving from Houston, Texas. No, I'm sorry. Either down, it doesn't matter, from Texas to, uh, to Boston, to Massachusetts. And um, this guy had to understand really quickly he was not getting 10, 10 acres of land. Had to understand real quickly that there's not a whole lot of place to park your car in Newton, Massachusetts. So you, you want them to acclimate to where, where they're going to be living to, through the newspapers, um, help them understand and navigate your, your congregation, um, and, uh, and you can be doing that as well. I would also uh, I want to underline again the bar and bat mitzvah class. It's unfair to ask your new rabbi to be in touch with your bar and bat mitzvah class now because your new rabbi has a congregation that he's working for or she's working for right now. But it's not unreasonable for the rabbi to send a blanket letter to all of them, uh, saying how excited he is uh, or she is to come to the congregation. You know that they're going to be the first families I'll be working with. And as I, the time gets closer, we'll make it time for us to meet this summer. Uh, it's also a great thing that kids love if they go to summer camp. These seventh graders, sixth, seventh graders, you can have um, the rabbi write to the kids at summer. But that's only after the new rabbi um, comes to the synagogue. Let me preface this, by the way, to, to tell you that uh, I was bar mitzvah. I became bar mitzvah on September 8th. September 8th was the first day of our new rabbi. I remember I have childhood memories of my mom flipping out, and I have very clear memories, my own memories, of thinking, what is the big deal? So remember, a focus on the, on the adults. Um, how do you say goodbye to an interim rabbi? Goodbye. 
goodbye. Um, again, you want to show tribute. Uh, this is not going to be a dearly beloved rabbi. This is going to be a rabbi who's been with you during an intense period of time. And so again, with a, with a, a Shabbat service of tribute, um, words of thanks and appreciation, um, and, and perhaps uh, giving the rabbi a piece of the past. Uh, because while interim rabbi comes and goes for one year uh, in a congregation, on the rabbinic side, these women and men have chosen to become interim rabbis. They're proud that they've been in six or seven or eight congregations, and they do grow fond of you. And it's hard to leave. They know they have to. It's hard to leave. Uh, so giving them a piece of the past, giving them something from the synagogue or a picture or a memento is really very nice and very, very appropriate. That's all we have, and we're right at 10 till. Great. So friends, I do want to um, invite you again to be in touch with me. Uh, my email address is dwolfman, W-O-L-F-M-A-N, at org. My phone number is 212-452-6735. Um, I am also cognizant of the fact that while I'm freely giving you all this information, I'm on my way to Israel. So, so I will really uh, be able to speak to you only through Tuesday of next week and then uh, after the 1st of April when I'm back. If you'd like, you can be in touch with your union rabbi, uh, whose names and pictures appear on the screen. Uh, we work together as a, as, a, as a tight team, and they too will be able to help you through this. Um, I'd like to end with the way we began with words of Sheikh Yanu. Um, this is a big moment. This is very exciting. Uh, to my rabbinic colleagues on the call, Mazel Tov. This is very exciting for you to be called to a new community. And I know you'll bring them to Torah with love and faith that you have. And I know that you're eagerly um, a little nervous and excited about entering into a new family. And to the lay leaders on the call, I need to say something that isn't said often enough. Thank you. Thank you. You're volunteers. You're giving of your own free time for this. And um, for many, especially for the presidents and for the search chairs, you've given more hours than you possibly could even try to explain to people. So thank you for leading your holy congregation through this endeavor. Thank you for rising to the level of the, having the highest religious office you can have without being uh, a clergy. Um, so mazel tov to all of you. I look forward to meeting you next February at our uh, Shalit seminar and uh, certainly to speaking with you in the months ahead. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.